Well done, Lucy, by the way, expert. Um, as we were waiting to come out here, um, you uh, uh, were in the hallway there, in the green room back there, in the, the bowels of this uh, theater, uh, and you, uh, you never stopped directing uh, because you just started sweeping up. If there was a broom, you grabbed it, and you started using it. <laughs> It's always, you know, these are beautiful events. You come out and bask in the, in the presence of the public, but in the back, it always looks to me like a place where the assassination is going to happen. Or <laughs> <laughs> so at least I try to sweep up so the pictures will look good. <laughs> uh, always thinking about the story. So um, I think to understand uh, the conversation uh, fully, I think people need to know where you were uh, in your career. So uh, two years earlier, Robert Evans asked you to direct The Godfather. Why do you think he did that? Well, of course, The Godfather was, was not a sure thing by any means in those days. There had been a few movies, I think one called The Brotherhood, that told the story of an Italian-style gangster organization. It hadn't done well. And, and uh, so it wasn't as though The Godfather or, or a movie of that type uh, was, was really necessarily a good move. And a lot of directors turned it down. And of course, The Godfather turned it down. I think Peter Bogdanovich turned it down. Several people turned it down. And certainly the great media, Kazan, I turned it down. Uh, and um, the script they had of it wasn't too great, I remember. At any rate, I had made a film called The Rain People, which I had written, and it was promising. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I like The Rain People. It was you know, the kind of film I, I really was interested in making. I wanted to make personal films that I wrote from scratch, the story, as well as the screenplay. And I got to do it with The Rain People, although it wasn't very little known. But uh, a couple of people had seen it and thought it had a wholesome promise. One of them was Peter Bart, who was the head of production, associate of Bob Evans, and I think he brought the attention to Bob Evans. Uh, and, and they looked at the situation. A, I was a screenwriter, or I was making my living as a screenwriter, so they felt that the script needed some work that I, uh, I would be able to pitch in and do it without a separate fee. <laughs> um, secondly, I was young and unproven, which meant one thing, maybe I would have some knowledge of the new equipment that was beginning to find its way in the film business, but more important, I could be pushed around. <laughs> and thirdly, I was Italian-American, and there, there had been some echoes of, oh, this Italian characters, Italian gangsters were you know, something of a cliche and, and might be offensive to the Italian-American uh, community at large, and, and it could be blamed on me because I was. <laughs> so I think those are the reasons why I got the job. And then, uh, you, did, uh, you did okay with it. Um, <laughs> uh, it does, you know, pretty well. And, um, and then naturally, just being Hollywood, they come to you and say, okay, well, we're going to do it again. We want to do The Godfather too, and now all of a sudden you had some leverage. That's true. For the second film, the first film was so, such a nightmare for me. I, I had two sons and my wife was pregnant. I had absolutely no money, and uh, they to say they weren't happy with what I was doing and <laughs> my decisions and choices, either in the way I wanted to make the film and ignoring the actors I wanted, I really was waiting to get fired every week on the Godfather. <laughs> I know you've heard that story, but it's pretty much true. And several times I thought I was fired, uh, all, only to discover that uh, they were going to stay with me. Um, so it was such an unpleasant experience to be unwanted by the management for so long that there was no possibility that I would want to do a second Film. I wasn't that interested in gangsters. Uh, I was thrilled that I had, you know, as we say, as Mario Puzo, the wonderful Mario Puzo who wrote the book, that I had dodged the bullet, I think you should say. 
because I really thought the film was going to be a, a disaster. Maybe from the reaction of the, my own studio that was producing it, they were so unhappy with everything I was doing. They didn't like the casting, they didn't like Al, they didn't like Marlon. Uh, they didn't want Marlon. <laughs> it sounds funny, but you know, you've got to always look at these things in context of the period. And you know, the, the, Marlon had been in a film called Cremada, which was not successful, and he was supposedly very difficult and, 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 and uh, would cause the production lots of delays, and stuff, which, what, which, had, which didn't turn out to be anything. <coughs> but to make a long story short, I, I said I absolutely do not want to do it, but I think I would be, I like Mario Puzo very much. I, I, I absolutely uh, was, I enjoyed so much working with him. He was such a, a wonderful man. And I said, I'll work on a script for a second, Godfather, and I'll even uh, help out as a kind of social producer, but let's choose a younger director, because I just didn't want to go through it again, you know? And uh, they said, well, okay. And when the time came, they asked me, okay, who is it that you have chosen to do the second Godfather? And I said, well, he's the director of Marty Scorsese. And they said, absolutely not. <laughs> That's a terrible idea. <laughs> So that was sort of the, the, the tenor of what it was. So little by little, we did make a deal. That, you know, I said I want to have total control, hence the power. I wanted a million dollars, which was fantasy number, you know, to toss out just a shotgun. But they said, okay. <laughs> but the third condition I gave them was that it had to be called The Godfather Part Two. And this was the sticking point. They did not want to have a movie called Part Two. They felt that that would be confusing to the public. Public would think that it was the second half of the movie they had just seen. <laughs> I've never been in an American movie called something Part Two. But finally, they gave into it, and, and then of course there was a series of Part Two, Part Three, the Rocky Five. Which, you know, <laughs> I don't see a lot of people passing on Rocky Five because they were worried that they didn't know what would happen in the first four. Like, like, um, your stories don't reflect terribly well on management at that fair enough. But, uh, uh, but part of the deal also was that you said, I've, you've got to let me make the kind of movie that I originally set out in this business to make, and you made the conversation contingent on your deal, correct? That is true, but I didn't say that. In other words, I, I uh, squeezed the conversation in without making that a stipulation, but they were being nice to me to allow me to do this script. But I, that wasn't one, in truth, that wasn't one of the conditions. But you knew you had them over a barrel. If you said, I'm going to make this movie, they weren't about to say, they just gave you a million dollars, they weren't about to sign it. Well, and at the time of this going on, the, the, before The Godfather, the year and a half or, or so before, I had the script of the conversation. And I was trying to get someone to let me make it. And, and, and it, you literally go hat in hand, beg people to let me do this movie. And no one was interested. And in fact, I, oddly enough, I had sent it even to Marlon Brando to play the part in the conversation. And I got a phone call where I actually spoke to Marlon on the phone, which was a thrill for New York Theater School from that time. And, and he told me, admired it, but he didn't think it was for him, so he turned me down before he did the job. So, um, so with this ability to make the conversation you mentioned before, like with the rain people, the movies you wanted to make were movies that you conceived of, you wrote, and you directed, like the conversation, not a big project like the Godfather. Right, I mean, I think anyone <clears throat> around the movie business knows that Excuse me, the heavy lifting is in the writing of it. I mean, if someone's written a book or a play, they've already done the hard part. And for you, sometimes it's tricky to adapt it because it doesn't lend itself immediately. In the case of The Godfather, it's quite long, and you have to figure out ways how to get it all into an hour and a half or, or, or what have you. In fact, a lot of time that leads to a very creative solutions. And in The Godfather, just as a note, the ending where there's the baptism intercut with all the murders of the uh, opposing families. That was something I came up uh, with 
Not because I thought it would be especially dramatic, but because I'd be trying to figure out how to take 60 pages of the novel and put it into the baptism ceremony. So sometimes the act of adapting a novel can, can be very creative. Thing. But generally speaking, it's really hard to write a story from scratch, and a lot easier to adapt one that already exists. What interested you about this story, about the conversation? Well, I'll, the truth is, number one, I had seen a film called Blow Up. And I just thought, Blow Up was a beautiful film. Thank you, well, thank you for Michelangelo. But uh, thank you also for also uh, appreciating that film. And I just thought that Blow Up was the kind of movie that I really wanted to make, that it was personal, that it was also uh, you know, mysterious and had narrative uh, drive or interested in what it was, and yet it was a, a, a personal one. In those days, the, the younger filmmakers, you know, in our 20s and early 20s, wanted to make personal films. That was because we had been imprinted by all the films that had come from Europe. Uh, so when I saw Blow Up, I was just so impressed. And, you know, when you're young, I think it's okay to sort of follow in the direction or imitate someone you admire, because you really can imitate them. You're going to try to imitate them, but you're going to end up with what you can do. So I set out to, uh, to do a, a, a film, and I had been having a conversation with a, a, a director you may know of, named Urban Kirshner, who had done the second Star Wars film, who was an older guy and, and very, very nice to us younger uh, fledgling directors, and I was talking to him about how interesting it was that there was technology now, microphones you could put across a city block and aim at the mouth of a person and then actually get that person's conversation. And wouldn't it be interesting if there was a mystery story in which some parts of it were left out and you had to piece together what was really going on? And you know, what is so meaningful to a younger filmmaker is that he was encouraging. Yeah, that's a good idea. You should, you should try to do that. Uh, and, and and so I, I, with the vision of wanting to do something like Michelangelo or was a blow up, and with the fact that Urban Kirshner had encouraged me for my surveillance, I, I began to try to write it. And didn't exactly know what I was doing, but when you write it very often, you don't know. You just set off on telling the story as best you can. That's what I did, and I wrote the script. It's uh, tricky with a movie like The Conversation, so I'm going to do something, and, I, and the lights are such in this theater that I can't really see you guys. So, will the people who have not seen this movie please applaud? <laughs> so I'm glad I asked you because I don't want to give anything away in our conversation about the conversation, <laughs> but we can portray it this because it's the opening scene. Um, that opening scene of recording the conversation that then becomes the focus of the film really uh, was is an amazing thing to look at and an amazing thing to hear and much of this movie is about what you hear. Uh, my understanding is that you the plot point that is revealed in that is essentially what happened shooting that scene in Union Square in San Francisco really enormously difficult. Tell, tell people how that how you sort of manage that? Well, what, what they're we, didn't, we didn't the uh, real way they would have done it. Uh, there, there were uh, Union Square surrounded by buildings going around the park. And the idea was there was going to be a couple, a man and a woman, having what appeared to be a very mundane, oh, nice day, you know, what are you doing? I'm going to have one of the dog. And yet, you began to realize that someone was going to do great efforts to record it immediately made the conversation they were having, which on its face value seemed like nothing, seemed like maybe it wasn't about nothing. And he actually put the cameras on these tall buildings with special microphones and zoom lenses to, in effect, shoot the scene as if we were really doing this surveillance job. And, and, and I had done by then a lot of research. And there would be other ways you would have uh, someone on the ground with a recorder in the shopping bag trying to get as close as it. In other words, you would use three, four methods on the theory that some would get some parts of it, some would get other parts of it, but you might get a majority of what they were saying through 
diverse of needs. And then later on, they would all be put together. So that's how it began, and that's how it did. And you'll see it's quite a remarkable uh, uh, piece of filmmaking to put together that, that first scene in the conversation. We were introduced there to a uh, uh, star of your film, uh, uh, Gene Hackman. Um, and he, was Gene Hackman ever considered for a part of The Godfather? No, but of course, after The Godfather, uh, you know, the actors, the New York, they were all friends. Gene Hackman had been a good friend of Bobby Duval. They were roommates. Gene Hackman, Bobby Duval, and, uh, and Hoffman. And Dustin Hoffman all lived together in New York. And, uh, and, and so Gene Hackman was enthusiastic. He had done so well in a film that inspired me to be Bonnie and Clyde. So I, um, uh, so I found Hackman anxious to participate in it, you know, after after the Godfather. In reading about your, some of your comments about this film, uh, you, you, Gene Hackman, you say is a lovely, uh, affable, uh, easygoing, likable guy, good-looking guy. The world is at his fingertips at this point. But this character he plays, Harry Call. Is a uh, is a sort of a miserable son of a bitch, a deliberately lonely, unhappy, lonely, unattractive, uh, unappealing man, and it really used to bug Gene to get into that actor's costume and be him. He became very grumpy, and then at <laughs> the end of the day, he'd be cool and he'd get his hair to be out and be a bald vivant guy in San Francisco. He was very uncomfortable. In that role, well, I always suspected it's because the man inside was sort of similar to what Gene had inside himself. Maybe I, I, I never, I, I never got to, to really know that, but, but I, I did. Uh, uh, I, he was not pleasant or happy in that role, and it was not fun to work on. Uh, but delivers, of course, an amazing performance. Turns out that doesn't. That he later told me that that I was, was thrilled that he would tell me. He later told me that it was his favorite performance he had ever given. Him. <laughs> you put in, or you and whoever worked on the costumes, you put in, I think in every scene, he's wearing a, a very particular French coat. Uh, I've never seen any French coat like it. Um, it is certainly given the character not stylish. Um, but it, it is, I think, clearly, deliberately revealing, uh, revealing about who this man is. Well, I've talked on my occasions of talking to younger filmmakers about how you make so many decisions a day. I mean, basically, should she have long hair or short long? Should she wear a slack-shirt dress? dress? Should, she, should it be like a sports car or, or a van or a sports car? You just make these decisions a hundred a day. But when I'm stuck and I don't know the answer, I always, in my mind, have what the theme of the movie is in order to. In the case of the conversation, the theme was privacy. So when they asked me uh, what kind of coat you wanted to wear, they showed me a half dozen detectives. You saw like a detective, I guess. A surveillance guy, the closest you could say, like a detective. And I wasn't really sure, so I put him in like a real, you know, Humphrey Bogart trench coat. Or, and they showed me a few, and one was a plastic sort of raincoat trench coat that was transparent. And I thought, oh, if this is about privacy, it's interesting to have them in a transparent raincoat. And that's how that choice got made in uh, that, that costume. And there's a lot of transparency in the movies, a lot of moments from what you see, you can sort of see through, but not quite. That was a theme. I always felt that a movie should somehow be a living expression of its, among other things, its theme. So that there was a certain clarity after the movie. Godfather was about succession. So that's easy, that's the scene. The father, who's going to succeed the father? Apocalypse Now, the theme was <laughs> what happens when you put 15 million volts into a 110 electrical circuit and what, what blows out? That's what Apocalypse Now is. <laughs> uh, let's take 30 seconds to talk about Apocalypse Now since you brought up. Were you stunned if, when that movie turned out to be as great as it is? Oh, I was, of course, so worried, and, and you know, it went on and on, and people were at home, I was in the Philippines, people were writing nasty articles calling it Apocalypse Win. <laughs> <laughs> you can't say that during this wonderful period, which I think in retrospect was wonderful, where I made all these movies in one 
you know, by six years, I was just very musical, depressed, insecure, worried person. Granted, the Godfather had been somewhat successful, but but Apocalypse was greeted by very uh, iffy reaction. So I mean, it's the nature of a young a young writer, a young filmmaker is by nature uh, frightened and insecure, and that's it's important to tell everyone out there. Uh, struggling with their scripts. Uh, I told young writers that I believe when you're working on your script there's a, a hormone generated that makes you hate whatever it is you're writing. <laughs> <laughs> the best bet is just turn it aside and don't look at it for a few weeks. You know, but that decade was, uh, you know, as I said, I had a little family, I had no money whatsoever, and no, no, no way of having any money other than this profession. So I, uh, you know, and during Apocalypse, no one wanted to make it, so I um, I borrowed the money to make it. But in those days, interest believe you believe this when I tell you interest was twenty nine percent. This was during the Carter years. Got up there, 17, 18, 20 percent. It was terrible. And I there I was, this kid from Queens. I owed thirty two million dollars. <laughs> and, and then when Apocalypse came out, it, it got some. Rough reviews. I, 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 I read one, you know, a man named Frank Rich, he's a New York writer. He said, Apocalypse was the biggest disaster of the musical the movie industry in the last 50 years. And I'm thinking, well, isn't there anything worse than that? So, <laughs> <laughs> reading the one movie, <laughs> has he changed his mind on that? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know that he did or, or, or that he should. You know, the truth of the matter is, when you're working, in, in the arts, uh, you're taking chances and you're, you're experimenting with what you think it ought to be. And, and if you have the right instincts, sometimes you're right, and over the years people begin to see it that way. <laughs> but at the time Apocalypse came out, it you know, came out, was in the Academy Award thing, was totally creamed by a movie which you call Kramer versus Kramer, and was just passed over. So we were very discouraged. But it was, what I noticed about Apocalypse is that year after year, people would still go see it, slowly. So, so Apocalypse was not like, wow, it's a hit. It was, well, it's not exactly a flop, but it's not exactly a hit either. And little by little, it, it people became more accustomed to it. And then they saw that it, in some way it did express something about that war. Uh, let me get back to the conversation for a minute while we still have a little time. Uh, Gene Hackman's assistant is played by John Cassell. And uh, in six years, John has now made five movies. Uh, Godfather 1, Godfather 2, Conversation, Dog Day Afternoon, The Beer Hunt. All five of those movies, those are the only five movies he made. All five of them nominated for Best Picture. That is, uh, what was it about, it's not an accident, right? I mean, he had something special that he brought to those movies. Special, and in addition, in addition, he was just the sweetest, kindest, nicest person you'd ever want to know. Really, uh, really, uh, just the adorable person that he took as a friend immediately. In fact, I remember we were all shooting Godfather 2 in Reno, and poor John has had lost, you know, two hundred dollars, and I was waiting. So I said, John, here I'll give you the two hundred dollars. Pacino said, why am I $500? <laughs> 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 no, 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, you, uh, you mentioned uh, the Godfather story of succession, fathers and sons, and, and, and given the closeness of your family, you've referred to your family so many times. Uh, in your career, not only did you, you win those five Oscars by, by 36, but you got to see your father won an Academy Award for music you got to the music Godfather right? too, and, and then you get to see your daughter won an Academy Award. That has got to be unbelievable. Thank you for your father and my nephew, Nicholas. And your nephew, Nicholas. Oh. Yes, Academy Award nominated. And your son, and, 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 and the son, 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 the
Uh, and now this uh, television show, he has uh, a, a motorcycle. So inventive, so spectacular, and critics love it. So that's got to be given how important family it is to you. That has to be just unbelievably gratifying. Well, I think those two parts of that sentence also uh, have an effect on it. The fact is that when they were all little kids and they were all coming to Napa for the summer or they were like young teenagers, I was, okay, this summer we're gonna do, we're gonna have one act play summer. So what's one act play summer? We're all gonna do one act play. We wanna fish and we wanna swim. <laughs> we don't wanna do one act play. And I literally had set up a barn where they all did directed one act play. <laughs> <laughs> and so they had that kind of context too. And also I had a rule very different than what it is today, is that if I were going to go on a, a, a job, an assignment, and, they, and, and be away for more than two weeks, that meant the kids were getting pulled out of school and they were coming with us. Which today is very difficult to do. So that meant they had all these experiences on these movie sets sometimes in, in, in strange, interesting in locations. In school. Right. <laughs> But they, you know, the uncle, the, the people uh, uh, on the production, Dean Cavalaris and all of these extraordinary production people, were the uncles and aunts, and they would go, Sophia would go to the costume department and they would make clothes for her dolls and her <laughs> doing makeup. And you, you'd see him come with a blood bucket in his head. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, Dad, I got shot, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so they really were like a, a, a circus thing. <laughs> the kids were learning this stuff. I mean, I did put them in school. I put, I put Sophia in a Chinese school in the Philippines so she could, she could sing songs in Chinese and count in Chinese. But, uh, that, you know, I don't know what she got. But what they really got <laughs> out of it was being on the films. Um, I think we all like the image of a six-year-old child stamping their feet saying, Daddy, I don't want to do a one-act play. <laughs> Kids are always saying stuff like that. <laughs> we, we have to go, but I, I've had the pleasure three times now of interviewing uh, Roger Corman. And uh, Roger tells a very funny story about one of the first movies he's directed. Uh, if not the first. Uh, Dementia 13. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, do you recall uh, how the name, because the movie was called Dementia. Well, he, he told me, we were on a film called The Young Racers, and, and we knew that whenever Roger, I was an assistant and sound man, and we knew that whenever Roger went off to make a film, which usually American International Pictures would pay for everything, he'd slip in a second film since all of those resources and, 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 and equipment was already there, he'd make a second film, which he owned. And uh, he, he knew that, that there probably would be a second film, because he had the cameras and the trucks and everything out there. So we also knew that Roger was going to come back and do a film with Titan. It turned out to be a wonderful film with Boris Karloff and Peter Laurie, I think it was called The Raven. Yeah. And he had to go back and make The Raven. So, a couple of the guys on the show said, well, my God, if he doesn't, if he's not going to make it, maybe if I write a script, I can get the equipment and, and get him to let me make a movie instead of him making it, because he has to go back that way. So and that's what I did, and I wrote something. He, I knew he wanted something like uh, William Castle's homicidal, <laughs> and that he would call it dementia. <laughs> so I wrote the first 20, 30 pages of that by a hooker, and then he, I did hook him. Said, okay, you go do it. So I would call it Dementia 13. So then every 13th of every month, we could release it specially and say, okay, Dementia 13 on the 13th. Yeah, I remember. He told, he told me, he told me what, this is true, I love hearing the same story from two different guys. He told me that they found an Azari movie called Dementia. And he was like, well, what if we just call it 13 and ask you, can you make somebody 13 in the movie? And then we'll just call it Dimension 13? Well, I know he did, he did, but the reason he gave me was that it would be good for 13 of every month. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it is... Just to say one last thing about the conversation. Oh, yeah, I made. The conversation is an interesting story. 
Folks, have many of you heard of the phrase called sound designer? I know. Uh, I'm going to tell you where that comes from. So, uh, what we were doing, uh, what we were about to do the conversation, a colleague of mine, someone who's a wonderful talent, and uh, was one of George Lucas's UFC buddies, named Walter Merck, <laughs> who was a wizard. A wizard in sound, and I had this idea to have Walter Merck actually be the editor who was pretty much known as a sound editor in those days, but he the editor of uh, the conversation, and he, he did that. But we were having trouble with the union because they, he was in the union, and, and he absolutely, uh, we said, well, he's going to do the sound, the sound. And we said, no, 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 he cannot have the title editor. He can't be sound editor or any kind of editor. So uh, I went to Walter and said, Walter, well, you can do it, and you should do it, but you can't be editor as well. Call me sound designer. <laughs> and that's where that phrase came from. And Walter did edit the movie and did that extraordinary job in both the editing of the film and the fantastic sound design that supports it all is the work of Walter Murch. Uh, and perhaps no movie that I certainly can think of is the title sound designer more relevant than in this movie. It is a, it is a pity that we can't also talk to you after this movie, because there are, of course, many things that I would like to ask you, but asking the mere question would reveal key points of the movie and too many people have not seen it. So, uh, we'll, another time, I hope, another time, anytime. This has been an honor.